China has been eyeing Africa for decades now. As growth in China slowed down, the CCP realized that taking over Africa was the solution. That's because Africa is expected to become a powerhouse in the coming decades. When you think about global superpowers, countries in Africa are the first ones that come to mind. As a superpower, you need to have a huge economy, a powerful military, and a lot of international influence. Not a lot of African countries have these things, yet. But a few decades from now, this is gonna be very different. In 2030, 42% of the world's young people will be living in Africa. By 2050, the prediction is that more than a quarter of the entire world's population will be African. Countries like Nigeria, Ethiopia, Egypt, or Congo will have one big advantage over the coming years, their huge populations. While the rest of the world is struggling with low birth rates and rapid aging, African countries will experience exactly the opposite. Their populations will be extremely young and it will be growing rapidly. Just think about it. Italy only has 1.24 births per women, while Nigeria's birth rate sits at a whopping 5.31. These demographics will shape the 21st century. In this video, we'll talk about the dramatic effect of Africa's demographics. You may have guessed this already, but this population growth is creating a huge economic opportunity. In fact, it is so important that today's superpowers are fighting for influence in the continent. And talking about influence, you guys can influence the channel by hitting the like button down below. Sometimes the algorithm decides to throttle some of my videos. Your support is greatly appreciated because it allows me to make more videos like this. Thank you very much. 70% of Africans are under the age of 30, and this is happening while the developed nations are experiencing a rapid aging population. A country the size of Rwanda can sustain this kind of population growth. It's so crowded here, they teach in shifts. Four billion, the population of Africa at the end of this century, basically going to be half the planet. Looking at facts such as birth rates and median age, it becomes obvious that Africa has some very powerful demographics. And as we've seen in China during the last 40 years or so, these powerful demographics are a very valuable asset. To illustrate just how much of an advantage your demographics can have these days, let's look at China's example in more detail. In the modern globalized world where goods can be traded across the entire globe, population numbers give a country an economic advantage. China's economic boom has proven this. When China opened up its market to the rest of the world in 1978, its huge population was one of the drivers causing spectacular GDP growth. The reason for this is simple. There was a lot of demand for labor, and especially cheap labor. When you have a huge and cheap labor force, it becomes easier to start an export economy. Companies across the entire world look for places with an abundance of cheap labor, so that they can produce their products as cheaply as possible and make as much profit as possible. In 1978, China was that place. All over the world, companies started outsourcing their manufacturing to China, because producing there was just pennies on the dollar. Nowadays, the result of this process is visible on most of the products you buy. You know, the all too familiar Made in China logo on the back of most goods. But wages in China have risen significantly over the last few years, as a direct result of their economic growth. This chart makes it clear that Chinese labor isn't nearly as cheap as it was in 1978. So is China still the go-to destination for manufacturing? Eh, not really. And population-wise, China is also going through some trouble. The country has a rapidly aging population, just like many Western countries. China's median age is already nearing 40 years old, and this is expected to rise to 50 within a few decades. There will simply be a smaller percentage of people who are able to work. So for companies seeking an abundance of cheap labor, China just isn't it. Companies will have to search for different places to find their low-cost labor. And Africa might be where they'll go. Right now, 60% of Africa's population is under 25 years old. Yeah, that's an absolutely crazy statistic. And Africa's total fertility rate sits at just above four, meaning that every woman has four children on average. With most Western countries having birth rates below two, this gives Africa some clear advantages. Because of such strong demographics, Africa will have a huge workforce in the future, and a cheap one too.
According to a United Nations report, most of Africa isn't yet industrialized, the only exception being South Africa. This is of course not particularly shocking, but it has a huge impact. 70% of Africans rely on the agricultural sector to make a living, which shows that many economies in Africa aren't yet advanced. Underdeveloped countries that aren't industrialized also tend to have a weaker currency, meaning that one dollar has a lot more purchasing power there relative to other countries. This means that wages are very low compared to other countries who've already fully industrialized. When you look at this map showing the median income per country, it becomes clear that the continent of Africa has the lowest wages in the entire world. In the long term, this will be a huge opportunity for businesses seeking to cut their expenses. After all, an abundance of cheap labor is an offer many companies can't refuse. It's a pretty good bet that many companies will move to Africa in the long term. And this isn't bad news at all for most Africans. When businesses move to the continent, African nations will experience an economic phenomenon similar to China, industrialization. Companies moving to Africa due to low labor costs could cause the entire continent to have an economic boom. The companies that move to the area will attract other businesses, which will then attract even more businesses, and so on and so on. I'll give an example to further illustrate this. Let's say some manufacturing companies move to a certain country. These new companies will attract a variety of other businesses, construction companies, logistics companies, producers of raw goods, energy suppliers, you get the point. Before you know it, you can have entire new industries. This ripple effect, which is called industrialization, may happen to Africa at some point in the future. As we've talked about earlier, Africa is a huge business opportunity due to its large and cheap labor force. So businesses moving there and sparking industrialization is not entirely out of the picture. And this will be a huge economic event. The industrialization of Africa will open up thousands of markets with billions of consumers. It will create market opportunities for existing businesses, and it will also give rise to many new business opportunities. In other words, this is a multi-trillion dollar enterprise. Now, I won't claim that this industrialization could happen as soon as a, a few years from now. I mean, in the short term, the economic success of African countries relies mostly on individual government policies. And to be honest, it doesn't look too exciting for the short term. It's important to understand why Africa failed to attract businesses thus far, and the reasons why it's lagging behind the rest of the world. Right now, corruption is a major reason for why Africa is still underdeveloped, and why it failed to achieve economic success. On the Corruption Perceptions Index, which ranks how corrupt different countries are, African countries scored 33 points on average. So to provide context, 100 points means zero corruption and zero points means a totally corrupt regime. So 33 points on average is a very bad statistic. Having a corrupt government doesn't help with a country's economy, because a lot of the money goes straight into the politicians' pockets. And corrupt politicians don't exactly have their own populations as their number one priority, which leads to bad policies worsening the economy. Another reason for Africa still being underdeveloped are the potential risks of doing business there. Due to political instability, social unrest, and a bad reputation in general, many African economies have failed to attract businesses. Many countries in the continent are labeled as risky, and companies that want to move their manufacturing don't prefer to invest in these risky countries. I should also mention the lack of proper education. 98 million children in Africa are not going to school. Although this doesn't matter for unskilled labor, it's still a huge factor in keeping Africa's economic growth and development down. But perhaps one of the biggest reasons is this, a lack of infrastructure. When there aren't roads, railways, and ports in a certain country, well, good luck doing any business there. Many African countries are suffering from this problem, a severe lack of infrastructure, which is keeping businesses away. According to a McKinsey report, Africa lags behind the rest of the world when it comes to roads, railroads, and energy infrastructure. To address this issue, African countries need more than $100 billion every year. When you don't have the infrastructure put in place, economic growth becomes impossible. All of these reasons make it very hard for African countries to industrialize within this decade. Corruption, political instability and a lack of education, and the infrastructure gap, they're all huge problems. But within 50 years, who knows how the situation might change. African governments will get new leaders, which are hopefully less corrupt. New government policies could also decrease the risk of doing business, 
and improve the education system. There are a lot of factors holding back Africa's economic development, but that doesn't mean Africa stands no chance in the long run. The economic problems are hard to solve, but Africa's demographics will definitely help in finding the solution. If African countries manage to follow the same path as China did, they can surely profit from their young and growing populations. And the infrastructure gap? That problem may be solved sooner than you think, because other countries are eager to help out. There's no doubt that leaders and governments from all over the world are looking at the situation in Africa very closely. After African countries industrialize, they will grow into sizable economies. To get a better position in the future, loads of countries would like to strengthen their ties with African countries. After African nations grow their economies, they will have a stronger military and more international influence in general. For other countries, this provides opportunities for cooperation, both economically and politically. All the more reason for global leaders to look at Africa, right? And that's exactly what leaders all over the world are doing. They're trying to gain influence in Africa before this industrialization will take place. Because when it happens, the industrialization of Africa could be one of the most important events of the 21st century. As you can imagine, today's superpowers have a lot of geopolitical interests and objectives in this whole development. Having influence in Africa is a strategic objective for countries like China, the United States, or the countries of the EU. Unsurprisingly, these countries are sending billions and billions of dollars to the continent in the hopes to secure a good position for the future. In fact, the major international players of today are fighting each other to get their own piece of the pie. So let's look at how this race for influence in Africa is reshaping the world of tomorrow. China's Belt and Road Initiative, Europe's Global Gateway, and the United States' Build Back Better World all have one thing in common. The programs are pouring billions of dollars into Africa in the form of investments. And they aren't just doing this to be nice for once and to help Africa develop itself. Of course, there are strategic objectives involved in these massive undertakings. The first one is securing an economic footprint in Africa. When African countries industrialize, China, the US, and the EU want to secure trading relations with these countries. It would be great news for their economies, and they sure don't want to miss out on any massive opportunities. So securing trade relations for both imports and exports is a must. Investing in African countries will help with these trade relations. The economies of the recipient countries will grow as a result, which provides trading opportunities. And most of these foreign investments come in the form of loans, which have conditions to strengthen trade relations with the lender. When China gives out money to build a port, it can make arrangements to allow Chinese companies priority access. So these loans can help to build solid trading relations. Another objective for investing in Africa is to make political allies for the future. There are 54 countries in Africa, so it's very useful to have at least some of them on your side politically. African countries will grow in importance because of their huge populations, so securing good political relations with these countries is a must. For countries like China or the US, one of the best ways to befriend these African countries is to help them financially. In huge parts of Africa, crucial infrastructure like railways, ports, or adequate road networks have yet to be built. Because many African nations aren't in the best shape money-wise, most governments turn to loans to finance massive infrastructure projects. And other countries are happy to provide them with these loans. After all, everyone wants to be friends with Africa in the future. Multiple countries are eager to lend out billions of dollars to African countries. These investments in infrastructure will spark Africa's economy to grow, which makes Africa's industrialization a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once the roads and the bridges are built, Africa can start participating in the global economy. One country understood this very well, and that is China. It is estimated that China has invested around $300 billion in Africa, which includes many infrastructure projects that Africa needs so desperately. These huge investments fall under China's Belt and Road Initiative, Beijing's International Infrastructure Program. In Africa alone, China has built more than 13,000 kilometers of railways, nearly 100,000 kilometers of highways, about 1,000 bridges and nearly 100 ports and 80 large-scale power facilities. 
And keep in mind that China is already the biggest bilateral trade partner of the African continent, meaning that economic ties between the two sides are already pretty strong. There are currently around 10,000 Chinese firms in the continent, giving China a strong presence. And the huge amounts of investment that Beijing is sending into Africa will only increase this Chinese presence. And remember, all the roads and bridges made with Chinese loans are obviously being built by Chinese firms. In a weird way, sending money to Africa actually helps Chinese businesses, which gets China an even bigger footprint. Now, we all know why China wants this influence in Africa so desperately. Africa is a huge economic opportunity for the future. For China, Africa can be both a sales market and a crucial importer of goods. The fact that Chinese firms could sell their products in Africa shouldn't be overlooked. With a forecasted 2.5 billion people living in Africa by 2050, Africa could be a huge sales market for China. Especially after the continent industrializes and starts importing more and more products. No wonder that the CCP is interested in growing Chinese companies in Africa. Ultimately, it makes the CCP more powerful internationally because it gives them an economic boost. Apart from exporting Chinese products and companies, imports coming from Africa are just as important for Beijing. China needs natural resources for domestic consumption in industries like car manufacturing. And a lot of African countries have an abundance of these resources. They have huge reserves of things like cobalt, copper, and platinum. Chinese state-owned companies strategically invest and take control over mines in Africa to secure the supplies of these essential minerals and metals. For example, they've taken control over cobalt deposits in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Apart from these resources, cheap labor is also a driver for Beijing. China now has a declining workforce and increasingly higher wages, which makes manufacturing less and less attractive to do at home. The Chinese economy needs to transition away from a manufacturing economy at some point, which can be a whole video on its own, by the way. Sooner or later, we could see Chinese companies moving their manufacturing to other countries. And Africa is a great place to move it when it comes to cheap labor. It's clear that investing in Africa has many advantages for China. And since a decade or so, Beijing has had the money to do so. When China's export economy grew to its current level, a lot of money was flowing into the country. China was exporting more than it was importing, and Beijing had a beautiful problem. It had a surplus of capital. You can see in this chart that China has a trade surplus worth hundreds of billions of dollars. At this point, China has a lot of capital sitting at home, capital that it can invest into African countries. That's why we're now seeing China giving out tons of loans, for example, in the Belt and Road Initiative. This has raised concerns in some countries because they fear that China is using these loans to gain power and influence. One theory is that China has so-called debt trap diplomacy. China could overload economically unstable countries with debt until they eventually go bankrupt. After this happens, China could take over all the infrastructure the debt was used for and take control over crucial locations. In some countries like Sri Lanka, the debt trap diplomacy has already worked. When Sri Lanka couldn't pay off its Chinese debts, it resulted in China taking ownership of a port in Sri Lanka for 99 years. While this is definitely concerning, it's not going to happen anytime soon in Africa. China only holds 12% of Africa's public and private debt, which is not enough to really take over the continent by any means. Although China is rapidly increasing its loans in Africa through the Belt and Road Initiative, it's a long way from actually implementing debt trap diplomacy in most African countries. But the theory certainly has gotten one aspect right. China wants to gain power and influence in the continent. And this didn't go unnoticed by other countries. Global Gateway will mobilize 300 billion euros till 2027. We have partner countries that have an abundance of renewable energy, think of wind or solar, to produce hydrogen. But it will also support schools and education systems. The European Union, which is the economic alliance of 27 European member states, responded to the Chinese plans by launching its own program. With the Global Gateway Investment Package, the EU wants to help underdeveloped countries by developing digital, transportation, and infrastructure networks. Until 2027, the European Union will mobilize up to 300 billion euro for this global project, of which 150 billion euro will go to African countries. 
Obviously, the European Union started this program as a response to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. After China started the multi-trillion dollar infrastructure project, the EU couldn't just sit idly and do nothing in response. But many criticized the Global Gateway Project for being nothing more than a PR stunt. 300 billion euro is nowhere near the amount that China has invested. Some estimate that China has invested more than a trillion dollars in the Belt and Road Initiative already. It will be hard for Europe to invest this amount of money in the foreseeable future. Apart from the difference in size, the EU's project also has some different goals than its Chinese counterpart. China's sales pitch is building roads, bridges, and railways, and all of that fast and cheap. But Europe's global gateway is focused more on sustainability and providing green energy solutions. And the program doesn't only concentrate on hard infrastructure, but also on soft infrastructure like healthcare and education systems. The critics of the project say that this approach won't work in Africa. Underdeveloped countries in Africa want to get lots of infrastructure fast and cheap, whether it's sustainable and green or not. And they've had enough of aid packages. They want to solve the underlying problem, which is the economic underdevelopment. But in some cases, the European approach with quality projects over the sheer quantity of them may actually reap some benefits. There are numerous Chinese infrastructure projects in Africa failing due to the poor planning and execution. The Standard Gauge Railway in Kenya is an example of this. A multi-billion dollar railway project aimed at connecting Uganda and Kenya with each other has failed dramatically. The railway project was stopped before it even crossed the Ugandan border because Kenya couldn't pay the Chinese debts anymore. The Kenyan government racked up a total of $4.7 billion in debt from this railway alone. And that's with a GDP of just $110 billion. Think about that. Wrecking up more than 4% of your GDP in debt for just one incomplete railway. Adding to this, the railway itself wasn't very feasible either. During the first three years of operation, the project lost more than $200 million. The railway still bleeds cash, even when it's operational. The reasons for this disaster vary from corruption to poor planning. This example is very telling. Sometimes the big and shiny projects turn out to be terrible mistakes. The European Union, however, focuses on smaller and more sustainable projects, which gives it an advantage. From constructing six small hydropower plants in Nigeria to constructing a solar energy plant in Djibouti, Europe can make some small impact with its program. And Europe does have some larger projects under the Global Gateway. For example, it's constructing a subsea power cable from Egypt to Greece to transmit renewable energy from Africa to Europe. The cost of the project is estimated to be around 900 million euro. And for Africa, working together with Europe certainly has its advantages. African leaders that value sustainability and don't want to end up with failed Chinese projects could turn to Europe instead. But the problem is that Europe doesn't have that much capital. With the six-year-long global gateway, the European Union is already struggling to scramble 300 billion euro for funding the project. A lot of money needs to come from the private sector, because the government simply doesn't have the resources. There are several reasons for this. One of the arguments is that the economy of the European Union is smaller than that of China. The EU's economy amounts to around $16 trillion in GDP, while China has a nominal GDP of around $19 trillion. But China's GDP figures are well, disputed, to say the least. I've made a full video on that if you're interested. What it comes down to is that China's GDP numbers could be much lower than expected. So China's advantage in GDP numbers could be minimal or even non-existent. Nevertheless, the European Union has one more disadvantage when it comes to these huge investment programs. Many see the European Union as a slow and bureaucratic organization. This is because it is a union with tons of different member states. In the organization, every single country needs to agree with every single policy it makes. When you're trying to organize billions of euros for a project like the Global Gateway, this becomes hard to execute. The plan needs to go through several committees and councils, which is a process that can take months to complete. There are a lot of political differences within the European Union, something that doesn't make cooperation go very smoothly. In China, however, it's a whole different story. China has an autocratic government in which Xi Jinping and the CCP just hold all the power. 
Now, this has a lot of disadvantages when it comes to things like, you know, civil rights and democratic values. And I'm not arguing that an autocratic government is any good. But a foreign investment program like the Belt and Road Initiative is much easier to execute for dictatorships. Remember, the CCP indirectly controls a lot of the Chinese banks, so it has access to tons of money. Xi Jinping can access billions of dollars without having to go through the same procedures as the EU does. And on top of that, Xi Jinping has control over a lot of Chinese businesses, so he can direct his resources top-down. And with his one-party state, Xi Jinping isn't going to have any opposition against his investment plans anytime soon. You can see why the European Union is having a hard time competing with China. Luckily for the EU, though, they're not the only ones trying to outcompete China in Africa. We work together on building back better. Build back better. To reset the clock and build back better than before. Build back better our economy and society. Together we can fix this. Let's build back better. In 2021, the G7 Forum launched its own infrastructure project to counter China's Belt and Road Initiative. The so-called Build Back Better World, the B3W in short, would provide hundreds of billions of dollars to underdeveloped countries. The idea was that the project would help with financial global infrastructure projects by giving out loans with low interest rates. Africa, with its huge infrastructure gap, was supposed to be at the core of the program. The reason for starting the B3W appears to be simple. Countries like the United States, Canada, or the United Kingdom didn't want to stay behind on the huge investments that China was making. And, just like the Global Gateway, this new B3W program was value-driven, according to the G7. The forum wants to focus on sustainability, transparency, gender equality, and addressing climate change. The G7 argued that this value-driven approach is what separates the B3W program from its BRI counterpart. The focus on quality loans and not just the quantity of them could lead to better results. But to make an impact on the huge infrastructure gap in underdeveloped countries, you need a lot of money. The estimates are that Africa needs $100 billion annually to tackle its infrastructure deficit. And the G7 isn't unaware of this. But even the G7, as powerful as it is, can't easily provide this amount of money. That's one of the reasons why the B3W project never really took off. The program stayed really vague, and it hasn't competed with China's BRI in any way, really. China has built thousands of kilometers of roads and railways in Africa, something the G7 hasn't been able to even come close to. The fact that the entire B3W project was renamed after a year says a lot. In 2022, the U.S. started a brand new and game-changing project with its G7 allies. Keep in mind, this was just one year after the Build Back Better World program was launched. The 2022 version was called the Program for Global Infrastructure and Investment, PGII in short. This new program is mostly the same as the B3W, just packaged under a different name. The United States aims to mobilize $200 billion by 2027, and together with other G7 partners, it will mobilize $600 billion. But it's uncertain if these goals will ever be achieved. Much of the funding will have to come from the private sector. The G7 won't actually provide these huge sums of money themselves, but instead, they look at the banks and investment firms to help them out. Whether this will work out, eh, who knows. In China, the government can just force the banks to help the Belt and Road Initiative. But whether the US can access capital this way is, well, questionable. But the fact that the B3W project kind of flopped, it's not a great sign. Nevertheless, it is clear that the United States and their allies are seeing the potential that underdeveloped countries, and especially Africa, have. The G7 is trying to invest in the African continent to reduce the infrastructure gap and to gain more influence. The United States is also starting to realize just how important Africa will be in the future. Washington is not only investing in infrastructure through the PGII, but it's also looking to expand mutual trade relations. With the Prosper Africa initiative, multiple U.S. government agencies are working together to achieve this goal. This project is connecting U.S. businesses to the African markets by providing helpful services. With the initiative, the U.S. government wants to spark private investments, imports, and exports with the African continent through the private sector. For example, it has helped a Texas company win a contract with the government of Ghana. If the United States succeeds in getting the private sector on board, it will help with competing against China.
the US government can't launch massive programs as efficiently as the authoritarian CCP. But it does have its good old capitalism and very powerful businesses. If the United States can convince its businesses to help win influence in Africa, the BRI has a serious competitor. Apart from the US, the EU, and China, there are many other players looking to invest in the continent. For example, India and the UAE are combining their forces to invest in African infrastructure. Singapore is also strategically investing in building up trade relations with their continent. And other countries like South Korea, Japan, and the United Kingdom are doing the exact same. The phenomenon is truly global. So to wrap it all up, Africa's demographics are truly going to shape the 21st century. Because of the advantages it gives Africa economically, industrialization could be just around the corner. Up to this moment, African countries have been underdeveloped due to several reasons. The multi-trillion dollar infrastructure gap is certainly one of them. But soon, this might change, because other countries are starting to invest billions upon billions of dollars in the continent. The reason for this is that everyone wants to be friends with African countries in the future. After these nations industrialize, it's crucial to have relations with them for economic and political reasons. Through providing loans and bilateral trade, players like China, the EU, or the US can strengthen their ties with these African nations. Because of Africa's powerful demographics, these countries are now willing to compete for influence. With all the different programs and initiatives competing with each other, the race for influence has only just begun. And this geopolitical fight has the potential to shape the 21st century.